meet the RAF's newest Spitfire. He's 33 days old and he's just driven all the way from Cambridge to Yorkshire. Good boy. Technically, I think Keith was driving. Spitfire was hanging out on the dashboard. Today, he's meeting some of his colleagues at RAF Topcliffe. <laughs> there he is, this is Spitfire. Uh, yeah, he's still, still he's got a flav, he can't fly yet. Uh, that's Paul. <laughs> Dennis is the one on the right. Spitfire is the latest weapon in Phoenix Bird Control's arsenal. The team is responsible for keeping military and civilian runways clear of bird activity. They have 20 birds of prey in total, and Keith describes them as mini athletes. He's just made his first kill, which is a buttercup. Well, look, there's a buttercup. <laughs> So why does the future career of this fluffy little guy matter? Well, since records began in 1970 till most recent figures in 2015, there's been 22,000 bird strikes on military aircraft, resulting in 40 MOD planes coming down, causing both severe injury and loss of life. Clearing birds from runways is kind of important. Enter Keith, biologist son Alan, and their team of bird scarers. This is a lifesaver. All airports have to have uh, bird control. Often we hear, well, you know, the birds were there first, you know, leave them alone. In a bird strike, um, the bird always comes off worse. You know, they, sometimes they score a draw and they damage the aircraft, but, um, but they, it always results in a dead bird. Spitfire has a lot to learn, and whilst he tries to work out how to get out of his box, let's see what his future holds. This is Flora, Spitfire's sensei. She's a master of her trade. Flora's uh, 14 years old. She's, uh, she's noisy. The, yeah, she is very noisy. She was the very first bird that I imprinted, so um, I, I made a few mistakes along the way um, in terms of letting her see me. Feeder. Um, so what does so that mean she, now? So it means that she's um, she does all the things that I want her to do, but it means that she's never really grown out of asking me for food. So she still thinks I'm mum after 14 years, and she still chirps at me as if she's in the nest. Which is why when when you sort of see Keith trying to feed Spitfire, he, he, he he's careful to avoid being seen doing that, and so that's to reduce the noise. Birds of prey, their eyes are fixed in their head. They don't move. Um, so whereas your eyes will make minor adjustments to judge distance, theirs can't. So they move their head instead to, to triangulate how far something is from them. Flora and her driver, Alan, are going to show me what Spitfire is it's aiming Flora to again. become. We're going to hunt some gulls. So he's a bit quiet out here at the moment, but she'll see stuff, something, you'll see her nodding her head. Um, Is that how you know? She's, yeah, when she's seen something, she's, she'll generally sort of start bobbing her head to judge how far away it is. So she's seen that this bird's going to start to land. And she'll, 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 the idea is to chase, not kill, right? Yeah, the idea is to chase, not to, not to kill. So she's, she's done a little chase and now she gets her reward and then we move on to the next flock. So she understands hand signals so she'll come round now but if I, if I put my hand out like that she'll go and do another circle. Oh I think she's just proved me wrong by landing on top of the vehicle. <laughs> she has. <laughs> Oh, I'll never work with children and animals. Go on, Em. Spitfire and Flora are both crossbreeds of two types of falcon, a peregrine and a lana. Characteristics of the two make them perfect for the job. A peregrine is quite aggressive, very fast. 
and this bird that you would traditionally hunt other birds with. The lanner is very buoyant in flight. It's quite a nice bird to work with. They've got a great temperament and that's great, but sometimes they're not as aggressive, they're not as aggressive as a peregrine. The peregrine being Scottish descent, they're used to living on a mountain, so you know, they just come, they don't really get wet. It takes a lot to get one of those wet. But the lana will get wet with just looking at a raindrop. So they, they like the sun, they like the sun. Drier weather. Training for this highly skilled role begins inside the egg. It takes 32 days to hatch. Then Spitfire makes a chip and starts trying to get out, known as pipping. Now Keith hits the whistle. That's the first thing Spitfire hears. It takes him two and a half days to chip out of the egg and another nine days before he actually opens his eyes. He's reared in a fish tank so he can see lots going on around. Dogs, sheep, humans. The more he sees, the better. This bird has got to be scared of nothing. At 10 to 12 days old, he leaves the tank. At 21 days, he'll try standing up and fall over. He's too weak for his own legs. But after another week or two, he'll master the art of walking. Soon, Spitfire will lose the rest of his down, his legs will change from blue to yellow, and eight weeks from hatching, he'll be ready to fly. Then the serious training begins. Spitfire must learn to be terrifying, to scare gulls and starlings and stubborn crows, but not to kill them which must be a bit confusing. Keith's task now is to take Spitfire as many scary places as he can. Landfill sites with thousands of gulls, Cambridge Airport. Last week, he clocked up a thousand miles sitting on Keith's dashboard. Did he come to Tesco's with you as well? Tesco's, yeah, oh, yeah, everywhere, absolutely everywhere. All you gotta do is basically a bit of chicken, really. It's nothing, you're not squeamish, are you? You're from Yorkshire. You know, Hard as nails, me. I know. Whilst falcons like Flora and Protégé Spitfire are perfect for flying in and out of vehicles on a runway, Lancaster the hawk has a different area of expertise. So hawks are very much sprint hunters and, and they hunt in, in structure. So naturally they would hunt in trees and woods. But the Harris hawk in its natural environment, it's a South American bird, it would hunt amongst cacti. So they're very good, that, that style of flight is very suited for dispersing birds from inside buildings, um, in and around buildings. Turn right round, let's keep it there, that's all right, don't worry, don't worry. That's it. Keith has a, has a tradition of naming his birds after historic aircraft. Um, so he's got Mustang and Spitfire and Lancaster. I have a tradition of letting my children name my birds. And that's why I end up with birds named Flora and Bruno and Mary and Bob. You get falconers that, that want to name their birds something that sounds scary and fierce. Um, I'm, I'm not one of those falconers. The birds only work regularly at certain airfields. Bioacoustics and pyrotechnics are more commonly used at many bases, with the bird team on call should they need them. OK, so this is our bioacoustic system. All we do is switch it on there. We have volume onto birds. So, that's a distress call for a pigeon. And all you have to do is switch this to the appropriate bird species. There's your crows, your, that's your rooks. Starling. Maybe use three or four cartridges a day. But it's really just the, the noise and the shock, not... Yes, yeah. Would you ever kill? Uh, last resort. We had a problem uh, two, three years ago with gulls. We had um, a flying ant explosion and we had hundreds and hundreds of gulls and we had to stop flying for two to three days and then we had to take some lethal action. Did you say a flying ant explosion? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, happens every two to three years. Yeah. The problem with both bioacoustics and pyrotechnics is the resident birds kind of get used to it. If you went shopping and you heard a large bang, you'd hit the deck, you'd, you'd be scared of it. But if you heard it at two o'clock every Saturday afternoon, you'd get used to it and you just wouldn't react to, to the loud noise. But if you went shopping and there was a lion in one of the shops, you probably wouldn't go in there. Home time. 
Spitfire resumes his position on the dashboard. This is now his mobile nest, Keith tells me. How much do you love your birds? Oh, how much do I love my wife? How much do I love my birds? Uh... Just as a, from a natural history point of view, they're amazing in terms of the things that they can do. You spend more time with them than, you know. Your wife? With my wife, yeah. Um, but that was in the uh, agreement before we got married. Their eyesight is incredible. They can see for miles. They can fly up to thousands of feet and dive at hundreds of miles an hour. Well, it's a, a dream come true for us and hopefully all the team, really. It's just working with birds and jets, really. And with that, they're off. Bound now for Rotherham to collect a new baby owl for the team, apparently. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel.